Um, I remember watching uh, TNG with my mom. I was born in 81, so I was like right in the pocket to watch a ton of 90s Trek when I was old enough to watch it. And uh, my very, very first memory, I know that this can't be right, but I remember Jordy yelling and being in a tree. And I think I've like mixed up a couple things. It might be like, you know, people would hang out in trees in the holodeck or something. But, but for some reason, I remember like, seeing this guy in this cool visor and being like, oh yeah, this is, a, this is my show. <laughs> like, I like this show. So at what point did you decide to kind of get more into it? Did you, did you do more in The Next Generation or did you decide to go back and kind of take in the original episodes? I, I kind of, I'm interested to what, what, the way you consumed Star Trek. Um, at first I was all, whenever TNG was on, I was watching it because that right. was back before. We didn't have the VHSs or any of that kind of stuff. So like, you know, a lot of the times I'd be jumping into a TNG episode and I hadn't seen, you know, the first 15 minutes because I didn't catch it exactly at the right time because I was a kid. So half the episode would be me being like, what is going on in this episode? <laughs> I used to go to uh, the last couple uh, TOS movies that they made. I remember I saw Undiscovered Country in theaters uh, with my folks and it just blew me away. Like I was like, oh, right, this is the best thing. Like Star Trek is the best thing. Yeah. Um, and then obviously like Generations and oh, First Contact might be my favorite. Like just absolutely what a banger of a movie. I love that movie. Deep Space Nine, I think I was too young for. It seemed okay. kind of maybe soporific to me when I was a kid. And then once I grew up, I was like, oh no, this show rocks too. Like now I, now I'm, I kind of had to grow into it, I think. Um, but I think that was back, I, I think I rewatched all of Deep Space Nine right after college, like in 2005. And that's when I just got nuts. I was like, I'm going to rewatch all of it. I'm going to consume as much of it. I'm going to talk about it with my friends all the time. And uh, that's when I started writing TNG season eight. I didn't move to LA knowing that I would do animation, but I knew that I loved animated stuff. Simpsons, Futurama might be my favorite. Um, and so, you know, when you want to be a writer, you've got to write all the time. And I remember I wrote a pretty gnarly maybe not great take on a, on a comedic version of Star Trek that didn't involve any Star Trek IP. And it was kind of based on the unspoken um, sort of like colonialist aspects of the Federation. And my manager at the time, her big note on it was, why does this have to take place in space? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> uh, okay, maybe, I, maybe this is bad. I was, I was so desperate. I wish I could just write for a Star Trek show, but there were none on the air then. And it was driving me crazy that I couldn't do a spec script for a Star Trek. So I started writing TNG season eight. The tweets was my version of getting to write Star Trek episodes, just pretending that TNG never went away, just like forcing and willing it to just still be existing. And it was just to make, you know, a couple of my friends laugh and my wife laugh. And then it blew up. It got like a hundred thousand followers. I only tweeted a couple hundred times. And then uh, I was on hiatus from the show I was working on at that point, and I just wrote a letter to a, a book agent, um, a lit agent named Kate McKean, and was like, I think I can turn this, this Star Trek Twitter into a book. And it, that led directly to Lower Decks because uh, a friend of mine who was an assistant that I, I met him when we were assistants at Fox, he was also an assistant in the same building, Aaron Byers, ended up becoming an executive. While I was going on the writer's track, he was going on the executive track. He ended up as an executive at Secret Hideout, which obviously makes, you know, all of this next generation of Trek. And he knew I was crazy for Star Trek. He knew I worked on Rick and Morty, which he loved. And he knew I had this book and that I knew tons about that. I just had a working, understanding love of just the world of, you know, the galaxy that the Federation inhabits. And that the, you know, he had me come in and, and, and talk to Alex Kurtzman about what my dream sort of animated show was that I never thought they were going to go for because I wanted to do a comedy and I wanted to do a 23, a 2380 era, you know, TNG era uh, show. And, and to their credit, they, it, I didn't have to beg or explain or, or like, or like bribe anybody. They completely got it. They got it. And, and I've been, I've been in heaven ever since I've been making Star Trek. I love the fact that you, you know that it's a very active community online. I mean, we've exchanged a few tweets talking about it on, on, on the internet. And <laughs> as you know, the, twi the Twitter sphere of Trek fans is very opinionated. In fact, I'd go as far as to say anywhere on the internet you've got Trek fans, you've got very opinionated people. So yeah. be, honest, be honest with me, Mike. 
did you feel a little bit of pressure when you're putting together Lower Decks? You know, honestly, <clears throat> I mean, I did. I felt a ton of pressure because, because I wanted it to be Star Trek that I would love. You know, I think that to n- I, I couldn't really feel pressure about the Trek community at large because there are so many different, like Star Trek is open doors. You know, I mean, I know there's, there's always people on the internet who want to be gatekeepers to stuff. And like, I get it because I think like very deep down, if you look past all the crud, Star Trek is really important to everybody that loves it. And you protect the things that you love and you don't want people to quote unquote mess up or change or alter, you know, these things that, that are a safe haven for you that you put on in the background to keep you company or that you've seen a million times or that you've invested a lot of emotional energy into. And I totally get it. I don't want people messing with my stuff like that either. I think like it's, it's a fool's errand to say that any series of Star Trek is bad because I think where Star Trek really lives and breathes is in its characters. And there's a reason that you can love TNG, even though Sub Rosa is in it, you know, like I can even watch Sub Rosa because I might not love the idea of, of Beverly Crusher having a romantic relationship with like a magic lantern, but I do love spending time with that crew. And I think that there hasn't been a Star Trek series where I don't love the crew and And any quote unquote bad episode, it's still 40 minutes I get to spend with a crew, with a Starfleet crew. I knew that as long as this, as long as Lower Decks felt like it had vibrant characters and it stayed true to Starfleet and to, you know, personal truths and scientific truths and, 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 and ethics and morals and and being the best that humanity can be, then I can still have fun in it. And yeah, it's not going to please everybody, but I actually think that if you let enough episodes build up, if you think it's not going to be for you and then you check it out and just kind of let it, let it just, just run and just be a part of it. I think people will be surprised because as much as I wasn't worried about people who are kind of gatekeeping Star Trek, I did. The show is kind of for that. Like there are so many, not only references, but just like themes and, and characters and, and, and even jokes that, that really play for people that love Star Trek. So ironically, anybody who really doesn't think that they needed a Star Trek animated comedy might be the perfect audience for it if they give it a try. I designed the Cerritos literally to look like the Reliant. Like I'm, I can answer any question about, you know, where are the turbo lifts? Look, <laughs> I, I've sat with the Okudas. We had them come into the office and I poured over Elkar's design with them. Not because we had to, but because we got to. Like, I am, I love Star Trek. It feels like home to me. And Lower Decks should feel both like Star Trek and like something you've never seen before. So, so hopefully it's, it brings something that you didn't know you wanted. Um, yeah. Now, Mike, feel free to answer this question by saying you don't know the answer to this because this might not be your area, but a lot of people have tweeted, and I have to ask the question, I'm from the UK and there's a lot of UK Trek fans over here. And uh, I think people have been looking at your Twitter, but they, people over the, here in the UK want to know, when can we watch it? Are you at least trying to make sure that we can watch it here over in the UK? I want everybody in the world to be able to see this show. And I think that something the internet doesn't quite calculate into, you know, it's always a mystery. Like you're always seeing like, oh, what is, what is CBS up to? What can we, is there smoke going to be rising? What color smoke is rising from the CBS studio lot? They'll indicate CBS wants all you guys to see it too. I think that the, I'm, I'm not, and I want to be careful here because my, I usually just go radio silent because I don't, I don't want to speak out of turn because this, this business stuff of like, the deal making is not something I'm involved in. I'm involved in making sure that a trill symbiont is called a symbiont and not a symbiote. Um, But from what I know, here's, here's the pieces of this I know for you guys to hold on to is that the, there are in the works, the way, a way for you guys to be able to watch it. I don't know the timeline, but the reason that you guys don't know yet is squarely because of COVID because the timelines of everything that we've been doing for production have been completely thrown out and are completely different. So stuff is actually a lot of what we were doing unexpectedly got shifted two months earlier because we were juggling around schedules and stuff. And a lot of the different groups in, you know, in entertainment, when you shuffle that stuff around, they can't move as fast as you. My priorities were keep everybody on the show healthy, keep the show being the best as possible 
and get it into everybody's hands as soon as I can because we're all miserable right now. And thank you. I did not know that doing all that stuff was going to end up having to leave UK and abroad other than Canada hanging for a minute. But it's not because we don't love you guys. And it's not because we don't want to share track with you guys. You know, Star Trek is universal. Like Star Trek is global. And the, the characters in Star Trek aren't, aren't an American set of characters. They're an Earth set of characters. And you know, we want we want everybody on the planet to be able to see this Federation show. I just want to say, man, um, we're very, very excited over here in the UK, and I'm sure I can speak for the rest of the world. There's a lot of very excited people ready to see some new Trek. Um, man, thank you for all the information you gave us today, and I just hope you get to enjoy seeing what the internet makes of, <laughs> and the world makes of, of Lower Decks, man. And, and thank you very much for having a chat with us, Mike. Hey, thank you so much. I'm so excited for you guys to get to see it. And, and I, I, I won't rest until all 10 episodes are out because that'll be when the real conversation happens. So Good I'm really stuff. excited. Thank it's, you. Well, you. You know, I'll be talking about it over at Trek Culture as well. So, you know, we, 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 we give it some good, some good light over there as well. <laughs>